As I mentioned earlier, many countries like the United Arab Emirates have both NOCs and IOCs working together. Mexico only has its NOC, Paymex. Let's look at the types of contracts that are used in the industry. As I've said before, you need permission to drill on somebody's land and have access to that land. In order to get those permissions, you need to have an agreement or a contract. There are basically three types of agreements that are currently in use. They are, one, concession contracts, two, production sharing agreements, and three, service contracts. Let's look at each of these types of contracts or agreements in a little more detail. A concession contract is one that has been used extensively throughout the world over the years. In this type of contract, the owners of the land give you the right to explore and produce the field, and in return you give them a percentage of the profits. Once you have bid on a lease and it has been awarded to you, no one else can drill in the area covered by your concession while it is in effect. In a concession contract, the operator makes all the investment and engineering decisions after bringing in the oil rigs, buying the pipeline, supplying the equipment, providing the infrastructure, and hiring and managing the manpower, he explores, develops, and operates the lease. If and when production begins, he pays a royalty interest to the owners of the land and mineral rights. A royalty interest, in this case, is a payment from the operator to the owners for the revenues generated by the sale of a specified percent of each barrel of oil or cubic foot of gas sold. In addition, the operator must also usually pay corporate taxes imposed by the government on his share of the profits. Remember, profits are what is left of the money after he has paid all of the expenses. Currently, concession contracts are used primarily in the United States, Canada, and in the North Sea. The second, the production sharing agreement, is favored in the rest of the world, especially in places with national oil companies. Let me explain why. In a production sharing agreement, although the operator still makes all the financial and engineering decisions, he must give up a portion of the production. This portion usually goes directly to a national oil company who needs the oil and gas for its own refineries or other downstream commitments. In essence, the operator and the NOC each take a portion of the production and the operator is allowed to sell only his portion. In other words, once production commences, the operator takes the agreed upon proceeds until he has paid off his investment costs. Once these are paid, the operator then splits his portion with the NOC. With what is left, the IOC and the government of the host country split the profits according to the terms of the agreement. As in a concession contract, the government can also tax the operator on his profits. The third one is called a service contract. The operator is hired to perform a service only and is called an operating contractor. He has few decision-making powers. Working under close supervision of an NOC of the host country, the contractor follows the orders of the NOC. The contractor may offer suggestions, but they do not make decisions about the way the well is explored or produced. Like any employee, the contractor is paid for his time and expertise. Contractors are usually paid a set fee that is charged whether oil or gas is found. Of course, in this type of contract, the contractor does not make as much money as the other two types of contracts. But then again, he risks very little and gets paid regardless of whether oil and gas are found. 
Over the last several years, the business of drilling for oil has changed tremendously. Still, with the potential for humongous profits, the business of drilling for oil nevertheless demands superb engineering skills, access to a lot of money, and the ability to make contracts that encourage exploration and production. The number of IOCs has been whittled down to a few super major companies, while oil producing states themselves now wield more power than ever. Okay, so let's review. The quest for mineral resources is as old as the history of humankind. Gold, silver, copper, precious stones, etc have always defined the wealth of a civilization and the prosperity of its citizens. When Francis Drake drilled his first oil well in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859, the modern petroleum industry was born. Uses for this black, viscous, liquid energy continue to excite the imaginations of inventors and entrepreneurs throughout the world. Their inspirations have produced machines that have transformed our world and the way civilizations function. Everyone uses oil and gas to run the devices that keep us warm or cool, that allow us to travel hundreds and thousands of miles a day, that drive the internet and global communications. We even use it to grow our food and put it in our drugs to keep us well. King oil controls our world and will continue to do so until another form or forms of energy come along that is as cheap and as easy to use. Because of its promise of wealth and power, every country yearns to be an oil producer. Some countries have used this windfall wisely and of course others have not. Nevertheless, because of the very complex methods of extraction, the oil industry needs the engineering experts and is willing to pay for their expertise. In the years ahead, as an employee of an international oil company, a national oil company, or a contractor, you'll want to lease from private or government owners a tract of land that may hold commercial quantities of hydrocarbons for you to explore. Your first step will be to make a concession, production sharing, or service contractual agreement for leases that will give you permission to explore and produce hydrocarbons. Within those agreements, you'll also be subject to regulatory oversight and be made to adhere to a standard of best practices that include protecting landowners' rights, maximizing efficient recovery of hydrocarbons, protecting the environment, as well as the health and safety of the workers and providing jobs for local citizens. Because national oil companies, along with their governments, now hold and control over 88% of the world's reserves, international oil companies will find themselves more and more using their own technical expertise to develop the oil fields of these NOCs. Working as minority partners in state ventures or simply as consultants hired to find and produce oil for a foreign government, the IOCs must better accommodate not only the financial and technical needs of the NOCs and their host countries, but also their political and social needs. Likewise, the NOCs must recognize the technical and financial advantages that the IOCs can bring to their oil and gas enterprises. Even as the symbiotic and synergetic relationships between the international oil companies and the national oil companies evolve and mature, it is clear that visionary men and women, engineers, the world over, will continue to keep the oil flowing, thus making our lives healthier, easier, and more enjoyable.